Assistant to Major Security Officer, um, Ms. Wanda jones -Hee. I'm also here with um, Jeff, he's from um, AFRL, Air Force Research Laboratory. Um, we've, teamed, we've teamed together to, to put together this Fast Track APO process. So um, I'm just gonna give a little background. I came up in the Air Force, I joined the Air Force when I was 19. I went to this horrible place called Aviano, Italy on my first base. And uh, I did uh, from the help desk to small computer work to um, I worked disc cap, die cap, RMF. We were doing cybersecurity before cybersecurity was a term and before it is it was sexy. Now it's sexy to get invited to everything and now we're cool. Um, that wasn't the case. Um, so I say that to say um, I, I am passionate about this work. I've been doing it for a very long time. Now switched over to the contracting side. Um, and it, in this case, and I, I actually own my own contracting company that I support. I am um, sub to a larger company um, on this particular project. I'm not saying company's name because it's really not a, a shameless plug. Uh, I say that to say that I don't necessarily need to support this contract. I do it because I really care and I really believe in it. Um, and anybody have kids out here? Everybody? Okay, everybody. And so, do you remember, maybe a long, 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 long time ago, when your kid was trying to take their first step, right? They tried to get up, and they was uncomfortable, they fell. The first time, they fell very hard. You held the hand, you still cheered them on, you picked them back up, and uh, the second time, they stood up a little longer, but they fell, maybe not as hard this time. Maybe the third time around, they walked over to the coffee table, and they, they held on. And then they were able to stand and they were able to walk and you guys cheered them on the whole way, right? Because you believe, you didn't say, hey kids, you're not gonna walk it up. <laughs> same concept with this. It's the same exact concept. You have to believe that we're gonna take this to the next step. But everybody around you has to be able to hold you up, help you up, encourage you. This process doesn't belong to one person. This process doesn't belong to Mr. Mary. This is our process. And so we really have to believe that we can kind of move this thing forward. Um, I only spend a lot of time on this because just like Mr. Marion said today, he asked that anyone adopted Fast Track ATO. Has anyone adopted Fast Track? Okay, I think we got one hand. I think we deserve a prize. <laughs> uh, Ma'am, do you mind me asking where you're from? What agency? I mean, what? A1 Apple. Oh, yes, perfect. Perfect, thank you. Are you doing like new software development? Um, so we're coding data centers and we're adopting it to get the fast track ATO from the cloud that you said you're the data center. Yes. Perfect, well thank you. <laughs> Thanks for trying something new. Is there any um, um, folks from the AO shops here or SEA? Can you if anyone raise their hand? I know Ms. Piaz is up here. Okay, what about the ISM or ISO community? Any of those guys out here? Okay, um, I'm glad to see that. I think honestly that the ISM and ISO community um, is probably um, one of the, the key players, not probably, they are the key players in this, but we don't give enough attention and information to that community and that's something that we're starting to work on. Um, so we're going to start this off. I, I really just say that so really for as we go through this process, guys, please, uh, please remain open. Um, please allow your folks to try something new or when they fail, cheer them on and help them up. Um, that really is the, the, the key to us being successful moving forward. So um, this is RMF Next Pathways. And so I'll try to move through this fairly quickly. Uh, I'm going to be honest. As when Fast Track came out, what we realized when we went around and, and started doing this role show about Fast Track is not a lot of people really understand RMF. And so it's very difficult to streamline a process that we really don't understand. So we understand, um, and the system understands that that's an issue that we are going to work. So we're going to try to do some distributed training and reach out, especially to the ISM community, a lot more. Um, and, um, and really try to help that community grow from an RMF process. Because what you'll really see is you, you really have the authority to do a lot of streamlining with that RMF without this memo that came out. And so um, anyway, so from RMF now, what happened was we did a lot of research and we did some, some things that CyberWorks, we brought industry together. 
Um, we brought some of the PEOs together, and they did. They laid out the process to say, okay, what is wrong with RMF, and how do we move to the next level? And so some of the work that we're doing in RMF now, because we always have to coin some term that typically doesn't make any sense, but um, <laughs> RMF now we start saying, what were the issues? And I've heard some of those issues this week about governance. Um, and when we say governance, we're saying, okay, cybersecurity folks are here making decisions and mission owners are involved, right? Um, that, that, that shouldn't be the case. The cyber is an enabler. We don't own the mission. And so we start looking at what is that? We look at the risk executive function. How do we bring those folks together? So that's something that we're still working with ACRI. Um, culture and communication, just, what, just kind of what we talked about just a second ago, was really getting buy-in. Getting buy-in from you guys, really getting to the point where you feel like this is part of your, this is, this is, this is your process. We don't own RMF. Staff doesn't own RMF. Yes, I can give you some policies, but I haven't touched the system since uh, I worked with Sire Hamilton probably back in Langley, <laughs> which is a long time ago, right? And that's why we did things like team up with AFRL, and we have to team up with you guys who are out there touching the system. Um, um, automation, we'll talk a lot about automation. You'll hear automation, innovation, and all those buzzwords combined. And so we'll talk about how we're really getting after that. Um, documentation, um, I think this week everyone's talking about how bad documentation is. So it's like, I really don't even want to touch that. But um, documentation, but some documentation is still necessary, right? There's going to be some automation piece, but it's going to be some documentation that's still necessary. Um, <coughs> Uh, so I think a lot of the documentation that we should be having should be doing the system development life cycle. If you're doing RMF and we just created all this document, so I think we've done something wrong in the development process. Um, also, control standards, looking at different baselines, different overlays, looking at who are our common control providers. When we get those things in place, that's really going to help automate the process. Those are the foundations to making this quick, outside of fast track. And then again, when we talk about, um, I'm not sure how many of you guys are familiar with uh, the new 837-2, they added the prepare step. And so that's like looking at things from an organizational standpoint. Um, and then we're looking at from organization as well as system level. Um, and what we can take from a staff perspective uh, off of you guys plate from organizations, like maybe an organizational uh, uh, enterprise-wide continuous monitoring strategy, and now you're just focusing on a plan. And that's why you see some of those things, like how we're adopting Tanium and those type of things. Those are organizational controls um, that the CIO has decided that we're going to control at, 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 uh, from an enterprise perspective. Um, fast track, I'll skip over that because we're going to talk a lot about that. And you've heard a lot about um, DevOps and the continuous ATO, and that's the software factory. Um, so that's, I'm going to make it as generic as possible, but I, you can say that's authorizing the, the um, factory and everything that comes out of it has an authorization. Oh, who has that clicker? Thank you. <laughs> okay, and so uh, I have to get used to this mic because I really like want to put my head like that, but I know I don't need to. So uh, Fast Track ATO, this is the background. Um, Mr. Marion came out with the memo, he sent a memo in March of this year, um, and many of you may have seen this memo, but it really just was the, um, it really just said, hey, He's, he and many of the leadership has received a lot of feedback regarding the RMF process and how horrible it is and how long it takes and how much documentation is required. And so um, I think what he did was say, okay, then I'm going to give you an additional tool in your toolkit to use to help you move faster, right? And, um, and, and so we came out with this memo. In there, you still, you still want to see there, there was two additional documentation, the overview of the entire process, as well as a sample decision brief. So just kind of ways to make, different ways to make decisions that's not necessarily based on um, 50 documents and entering individual control kind of in RMF. It's kind of where we, I mean, and, and EMAS is where we started. But um, you still have the requirements to meet, you still have to meet FISMA requirements, you still have to meet, um, you still have to reach your, your over, any overlays, PII overlays, those requirements do not go away. Um, and then you still have to register in um, ISIPs as well as EMAS. And we'll talk a little bit about that because EMAS currently does not lend itself well to the fast track ATO process. So that's something that we're going to continue to work. I guess the next slide. 
So uh, I'm going to go over this real briefly. Some of the things you're going to see is we tried, what we did was we put a framework behind Fast Track, right? And so that you'll see that Fast Track is, does not take us away from RMF. It's a more streamlined approach to implementing RMF. So we're not saying that there is this distinct, separate, you know, process. It really falls within an RMF framework. And so we've done some work to kind of really lay that out. It's just a, a different way of thinking of um, implementing each of the steps. And we'll go, into, we'll go into this a little further. Now, Fast Track, we feel, really covers that, that two through five. So a lot of what you do from an assessment standpoint, instead of doing typical kind of um, documentation, we'll assess, we'll assess um, security you know, using things like a bug bounty or a penetration test. And that's kind of what makes it faster. Um, and some folks definitely feel like it makes it more secure. I think the combination of the both um, really does make it secure. The, the, the other piece I want to highlight this is this is um, the AO. The AO really defines this as far as the, the AO has to agree for your systems to go through the fast track process, the AO is going to define some interest criteria. And so what we've done, and let me also highlight this because someone asked a question to Mr. Marion in the main brief that um, something similar to they didn't, they didn't, we didn't, they didn't adopt fast track because fast track is for kind of the newly developed systems and it's not for the legacy systems, right? And so um, I think that was the original intent of fast track was our newly developed software that went through this, this DevSecOps process and was going to be transitioned over to a FedRAMP approved cloud service offering. That was its original intent. Um, how many people out here are developing new software? How many people out here really focus on the legacy systems? Exactly. And so what happened is when this memo went out, it was, okay, the legacy system, like, what about us? We are the ones that need to use this. And we really, we really agree. There's a lot, I think, going on from a DexDevOps and Kelsey Ryan. I think we're getting a lot of um, uh, marketing and a lot of help in the DexDevOps area. Um, and it's, it's sexy, right? It's new, it's, it's sexy. Legacy systems is not so, not so much. And so I think we've, um, what we've tried to do with this process is really, really outline how can we develop this same mind frame, same, same framework for our legacy systems because that's what we see we need the bulk of the help. Next slide. So when Mr. Marion, uh, when, when this memo came out and it was signed, uh, we really, we did a lot of outreach, we received a lot of comments from the field, and this is kind of the answer to some of those, those comments. We tried to, um, we tried our best to implement some of your concerns, or most of your concerns, in this process, right? So one of the main issues I think that went out, the main issue was that when, the, when, when folks saw the memo, they felt the memo was too vague. Um, and, and, and it was very difficult for people to adopt this because they didn't feel like the memo gave enough direction on how to adopt or what the process was or the intent. And so, um, and, and I think from Mr. Marion's perspective, that was done purposely. It was done purposely. Their thought is, okay, AOs, I'm just gonna give this to you. I want you guys to think about the best way to implement this for your system. And so um, I think it worked well because it did force all of us, um, and, and especially us um, career cyber folks, to really start thinking about coloring outside the lines. Um, and I think this really kind of gave us that the go ahead to do that. I think there was some, a lot of questions regarding um, going away from policy, going away from what DOD has mandated. Uh, I just want to assure you guys that we sent this process through general counsel. Uh, we've sent this process through DOD. They actually were very excited. Uh, so this has um, been approved uh, up the chain. So um, what we've done um, from a vague perspective, we did try to, we, we, uh, we did, we developed some processes. Again, we, this is what we really have team with AFRL. The staff perspective, we are policy, we are governance, we are compliance, we are not necessarily the technical arm, we are not, not necessarily the process folks. So uh, this is again where we kind of covered outside the line that we reached out to our partners um, in, in both the Air Force and in um, industry. 
So we've developed templates, we've developed guidelines, assessment guidelines, we've developed uh, artifact rubric. We're gonna go through some of these things um, further on in the briefing. Um, it was also an issue where folks, especially from the AO community, are saying, okay, you're gonna use this process, it can't be implemented in, um, in EMAS, how you're taking away my visibility. We heard that loud and clear, so what we're doing now, if this will, um, with, with AFRL help, after we go through a couple of use cases on these legacy systems, we're gonna document those workflows and then we're gonna make sure that those workflows are available with that EMAS. So you'll be able to adopt this in EMAS. And you'll, what we're trying to do is we're doing everything from a customer experience focus. So we're doing a lot of reverse engineering. So not focus on necessarily the controls. We looked at, okay, what document will answer this control? So instead of saying, okay, let's implement CMA, we may say that, okay, if you've updated your hardware software list, we're gonna reverse engineer and if we know that this answer 15 controls. I'm just being very generic, but I do have a really cool and ugly slide um, and back up if you guys want to see it. Um, so that's the type of work. So we're thinking through all of that. It's, it's, it's taking time, um, but it's all in the works. Adversary assessment. I think this was really the crutch. This was an issue that, um, this was a concern for many. Yesterday we had a separate brief that was specific just to penetration testing. So, um, so we had uh, Air Pharrell as well as um, um, Air Pharrell Jessica, she briefed, as well as both from Dark Wolf. And so um, we kind of really went into kind of adversarial assessment. The issue there was who are our pen test resources in the Air Force? Is what is considered a trusted advisor? How do we get access to those pen test resources? Um, and so what we've done, we've developed kind of a document you'll see, but we work with the DDS, Defense Digital, Defense Digital Services. They focus on um, bug bounty um, and cloud sourcing. We had uh, Alisa Fiola really helping us out with that. And we also have worked with, again, Wolf, um, Dark Wolf now and AFRL. So we've identified at least three resources that we've partnered with to give you access to that. Um, we're not saying by any means that that is the only resources. If they're, you know, not to say that you couldn't go out and and, and work with your own bug bounty team. But if you use one of our partners, they know and they're familiar with the, the fast track ACO process. And so, um, and it's gonna make it fast track, the purpose of it is to be fast, right? So we have to go out and secure additional, um, if you have to secure additional pen test resources and go through the contracting process, it's gonna, it's not gonna be so fast, right? And, um, and so from cyber hygiene, that was another area. The, the memo focused mostly on the CSF framework. It didn't necessarily speak to controls. Um, I think at the time, leadership was, was really not happy about the term control, so they kind of wanted to push away from controls, and implementers are saying, hey, wait a minute, that's our common lexicon. So I think um, we've, we've really worked hard. I kind of worked hard, I think, Ms. Jones, he's giving me that hmm kind of, but work hard to say that, you know, using controls as a common lexicon really is a big step forward for us. Um, and it, so you don't want to take those, you don't want to take that common lexicon away um, because really everyone is using it, right? If you're going to do physical reporting, they link it to controls. Anyone that you're dealing with, if you're dealing with supply chain risk management, they link those requirements to controls. So that really is a common lexicon that we're all using. I think it's just that the leadership is concerned because people are saying I have to implement a thousand controls and CCIs and we're not putting a lot of thought in, 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 in the requirement and how we're implementing. But that goes back to not understanding RMF. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Um, working RMF, you're working with a lot of cyber fiscal systems. And this is going back to your adversarial assessment. Um, is there space in there to use routine with table topping versus doing adversarial assessments? Because it's a little dangerous where you're with cyber fiscal systems to take the critical operations. Yes. Yeah, so I, 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 so I, I'm going to repeat the question. I think is is there an opportunity to not only use kind of a a, a, a blue like a pen test, but also using um, things like tabletops and maybe IBMs and different options with that? Is that the question? Well, oh, this is mostly uh, legacy systems. But, yeah. Uh, that are in operation or producing parts, but uh, an ICS type. Oh, I so see, it's very see. difficult to go in there and do a pen testing on something that's creating parts uh, and running it uh, in uh, full, uh, full spectrum. So 
So I think that we can, uh, I think that's something that, that we can look at. We do have that from, and I'll get to a slide a little later as it relates to continuous monitoring. We've kind of outlined some things that we can use like a tabletop, different forms of IVMD, as well as um, penetration testing. Now I think there are also going to be options that maybe you're not doing a live uh, uh, and operational type of um, pen test. You may have to do some, maybe a um, test environment. Right, if you, if you have the ability to do a test environment that's, that's identical to your live environment. I don't know if, um, did you want to add, um, did you hear that question, Jack? Yeah, so I think it really depends on the discussion with your AO. Um, are they going to have a comfort? What's going to be done from a blue team? Because I understand legacy systems don't always have test environments. And the commission is that you don't want to bring down, potentially bring down the pen test. Having that discussion with the AO, and they may say, okay, present me a, a test plan, what it's going to look like, then they'll make a decision from there. But it's hard to say, yes, you can go do this without knowing who your AO is and if they're willing to accept it. So. Sorry, can I answer the question? No, it's not a great answer. I mean, no, that brings a good point, right? This is not going to be, this particular process is not a cookie cutter, cookie, cut, cookie cutter process. It really is about making risk-based decisions. It really is. It is really that you have to look at your environment. You're going to have to, you have to, you have to collaborate across your, your, with your PM, with your AOs, with your staff to see what's going to be acceptable to them. I know um, we're working with um, Ms. Pam Piazza for, um, um, Sam, you in here? I think she's somewhere, so she should be somewhere here. But um, so that's the from an enterprise perspective, right? So ACC, and so they are developing a process using I'm using this foundation, but really they're going to develop a process on what they are they are comfortable accepting, and a process that they are willing um, are they willing to accept from their their PMs and their ISMs. And so um, that's that's exactly right. You really have to think these things through and analyze what works for your environment. Um, so cyber hygiene, um, and I think that's where we are. We we're really focused on, again, the memo really focused on uh, cyber, cyber security framework, so more kind of identify, protect, protect, respond. So that's high level, um, and, and, I, and that's important because that's the way that we're really going to have to start communicating to our leaders for them to understand the importance of cyber security. When we go in and brief our leaders and say, hey, sir, you know, uh, RA7 is red and, and AC, three is this and they're like, what are you talking about? And so one thing we haven't done a very good job in the cyber security, cyber security community is learning how to communicate with others outside of our community. The, the we understand, but, um, and it's because for the most part, honestly, no one outside of our community in the past has been very interested in hearing what we have to say. And so now we have to learn how to communicate in a compelling way to those folks. And that's why we have some different frameworks like the CSF. But again, that's very high level. You can't, you can't just communicate based on, you know, identify. Really, what does that mean? So you, it is a lot of, we cross work the RMF controls to the identify category. And then now we can start having those conversations, right? From an implement, implementer's perspective up to the C-suite. And so um, um, we also, from that, from a, from a security baseline perspective, we start looking at things, um, in the automation and, and using things like Tanium. I know we just saw that, again, that memo um, signed by Mr. Marion and AQ that um, is kind of forcing Tanium to be added on our system, which I think we, we, that's a move in the right direction. And so um, those things like a Tanium, once we get to the point where Tanium can match directly to controls, we can do a lot of automated updating of your controls, but you're not trying to answer 400 controls on your own, right? Um, that's hopefully in the near future, but we know that that's in the future. And so we're still, we're working that. And then we're also working to make sure not only does it answer individual controls, but that it can also roll up and, and, and get to that CSF category to say, okay, from a dashboard perspective, I see we have some issues in responding. 
right, or recover. And so now, not only can we implementers provide input to that, but our decision lead, our, our, our leaders can make decisions. It's very difficult to make a risk-based decision based off controls right now from a leadership perspective, okay? And so um, work, uh, workforce knowledge of RMF, uh, if I had, I know opinions like us, buttholes or whatever, but everyone has one, I would say something else, a mixed company. But in my opinion, our major issue in the Air Force really is people. It really is the workforce. It really is training, but a lot of it has to do with the people and getting the information and make sure they're trained and make sure that we don't make this too complex for people. A lot of us are real, there's some, there's some real smart folks in here, very smart some engineers, some industry partners, um, and there's some smart folks out there in the field, but maybe they are not as um, uh, knowledgeable on this process. And so we make it, right now, it, it's pretty complex for them, and it's difficult for them to implement this in the field. And we, we're seeing that, that folks are raising their hands, that we, we, need, we need help, we don't understand. And so we're finding a way to do distributed training. We're working with DAU, um, to put some training out there, not only from a fast track perspective, but training that's going to help folks kind of understand the foundation of RMF and understand their bounds now. Um, you will be surprised, really, at this level right now in the AO community, you can decide what your critical, critical set of controls are. You can say, hey, I'm going to do these critical set of controls, and I'm going to give myself a conditional ATO, and then from a conditional ATO, I'll continue to implement. You, have, you are empowered to do that now. Um, but, but people don't really understand it. And I understand that um, uh, we really don't know what's acceptable. So we're working on a, a risk tolerance kind of baseline from the Air Force perspective to help with, okay, these are our bounds, right? Um, we're also gonna have some start facilitating DCS sessions. Um, and hopefully we keep this up. The first three is gonna be focused on fast track, um, but hopefully we will continue to grow this and you know, as new topics come out, uh, we'll, we'll provide DCS sessions so you guys can reach out to us. And honestly, in this process, until AFRL came, um, it was, um, I was a lone ranger kind of developing this. And so it's hard to develop a process and to, you know, constantly have to do the communication and have to do the individual briefs. I love it because I love when you guys throw darts to help us develop a more thorough process. And we love hearing the feedback from you guys, but we have to find a way to kind of do some more, um, some trainings like this when we get more people involved. Um, I think that was my cue that I stayed on that slide too long. And so, um, okay. <laughs> okay, 10, 10 30. Um, okay, so we talked about really the key, um, the keys to success for fast track is your security baseline, the assessment we're talking about with the pen test, and continuous mind. I'm going to go through each of these, but I just want to highlight the decision point here. So we're going to have some form of an interest criteria. We're, we're just going to give you a template of an interest criteria. From an AO perspective, they're going to develop that what really, what really fits the bill for fast track, right? What's acceptable. So from a baseline perspective, we talked about this. What are our minimum set of controls? What are we listing as critical controls? Um, the difference here um, is what we're saying. It's not only going to be the controls, it's gonna how we're going to answer the controls. We may not answer each individual control in fast track. We may have some form of a, what we're looking at as a, an executive um, an executive summary, right? You may answer these controls in paragraph format to say, this is how I'm getting after this. You know, I have my stigma in place. I did this, this, and this, whatever that may be. Um, again, we're going to find a way because we don't want to focus on documentation. We want you to say, hey, I went through the whatever, set that box process, and I'm moving here. So more so kind of explaining and making risk-based decisions. We also have what we developed from an AO's perspective, I think that will help the AO as well as uh, the PM. We can go to the next slide. Is the rubric, is the artifact rubric. So what, what you see here, um, and we still have work to do here because we're overlaying like the tool set that will really help us get after a lot of this. So on the left side, you'll see like these are some of the artifacts that we're going to ask for, or some of the information. But it may not be in traditional documentation like 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 we like we're accustomed to. And so this is a way to kind of grade what those documents look like from a poor to an excellent. 
So what we're looking at here is it's going to help from an SEA perspective or from the, from the, the enterprise perspective. This gives us scalability on the process. It really is good to have a memo where people need to be able to scale this across the Air Force. It needs to be repeatable and people need to be working toward the same goal. And so that's what we're kind of outlining here. This has been through about five iterations since this in the last week. So um, not exactly this, but what this also helps you do is once you get to your continuous monitoring, when you're looking at these same documents, the AO or the SEA, they'll be able to say, am I progressing or am I regressing? And based off that, okay, last time maybe you were at a three for specific documentation, um, and now you're at a two. So when it comes to continuous monitoring, I may not be able to do that tabletop. Maybe for you, I'm gonna have to do a pen test because I see there's some issues here. So that helps you kind of decide. Again, this is a really, this is a thinking exercise. So we're gonna be making a lot of risk-based decisions. So, going back to this previous slide, you'll see in the RMAP controls uh, column that some of them are bolded and uh, a little bigger font. And those are the FISMA related controls. So, we're trying to take away a focus on artifacts and producing different documents. And although we know documentation is important to understand what your hardware was, what your software was, what does your topology look like? How's data flowing through the system? We want to reduce that emphasis and create a simplized uh, baseline that really focuses on your system engineering documents that are going to, should be produced for you. Some of the legacy systems may have a delta there to fill. So it's something we're trying to get away from the traditional documentation piece and go more towards our assessment piece. So understanding what the vulnerabilities on your system are and allowing the SCA and AO to make and your PM or information system owner understand what the risks they're taking on with this system, how it looks like right now. So going through penetration tests, having them go through that painful process with you, but being willing to get better, uh, improve your system, understand where it's at. It's gonna give you an opportunity to learn your system especially for those legacy systems. Having those servers that you don't necessarily know you have, and then all of a sudden they're found during the test, well, those servers you didn't know you had were probably not getting patched either. Therefore, they had vulnerabilities. Therefore, there's your attack vector. There's your opening. So the penetration test or the assessment piece of fast track is really to Take an approach away from the documentation, saying you do things, saying you patch the system, and actually showing that you do it, um, seeing if they can escalate privileges and get further in your system and exploit data. Um, obviously, the plan that's developed needs to be scrubbed through your PMO, our PM, information system owner, the AO SCA, is um, understand what the boundaries are, what you need to, you know, where should I not go past? Should I not probably bring down the mission? Um, those are all discussions that need to be had. So here's a fairly high level workflow um, for the penetration test. And you're developing the plan, you're going through the, the test, and a report's going to be generated. And from that report, it's going to feed into a AO decision brief. Um, it's going to allow you to identify the risks of the system. Uh, where you're weak, where you need to get better, how can you get better? Um, from there, you know, you're going to work with the AO and Scott and develop a plan. And if they're comfortable with everything, potentially with ATO. Um, ATO conditions or re engineering apply, or maybe fast track is in the right path. So the next big key to fast track is continuous monitoring. <laughs> Have your penetration test, you understand where your system is, it's documented, everything's good to go. And then you get your three year ATO, and then you say, okay, I'm good for two and a half years. And then I gotta scrub and figure out, oh crap, I gotta go patch stuff again. And you actually know your system hasn't been compromised? Uh, I guess you'll find out. Uh, that's not the recipe for success. So that's why there's a focus on all these automated tools, using 
updated services as much as you possibly can. Um, legacy systems, that may not be, you know, may not be an option, but we need to develop a plan on how you're going to monitor your system, how you're going to patch your system, how you're going to report metrics. Um, that's one of the key pillars for Fast Track ATO. Um, you need to have a strong staff that's going to be able to do this, willing to improve, and really focus on, let's keep your system secure, rather than just updating documents all the time. So, on an AO prescribed basis, you may get a, and, and this, let me throw this out, this is not a one size fit all process. This is why the communication is important with your SCA and your cybersecurity staff. You need to understand, you know, I may only get an ATL for a year, and next year, when I need to um, renew it, I may need to have another penetration test. Well, maybe not. Maybe you just need to provide some scans, uh, updated, you know, your topology, your data flows. Maybe there's a new threat that formed in your system, but you understand it, you protect it against it, um, and then present that to the AO. Sometimes there is a, there may be an IVMP requirement. So a team come out, sit down with you, understand the system, where it's at, provide that recommendation to the AO. This is really all that the AO recommendation is. So, um, what we're doing here is, uh, we're gonna go through this fairly quickly because we want to take some time for you guys to ask questions. <clears throat> but the whole premise behind this is to show you that from a framework perspective, we are still using the RMF framework when we're talking to Fast Track. So it's not that we're getting away from a framework. This is just to pick that this is a, a, a different option to get it after an authorization. But it still fits within the framework. Um, so we're still asking that, we still fit within that um, CSF construct. So most from a CSF perspective, we're using that from a, com a communication that from our implementers to our C-suite and our decision makers so they can make decisions based off this process. So this is really just depicting that. We've kind of talked about some of these documents already that we've developed. Uh, we, are in a, we are in the process of really just kind of developing, I want to say a tool set for you guys to use to implement this. I will highlight the fact that with the memo right now, you are empowered to use Fast Track ATO. If we didn't put a document up here, if we didn't put a workflow up here, you guys can use it as long as your AO is in agreement, and your, your system owner and ISM, as long as you guys are on the same page and you're talking with one another, you can use Fast Track. You can use pieces of Fast Track. You can say, I'm going to have a baseline and I'm going to do pen tests. And you can call that Fast Track, right? The memo really kind of just says, hey, <laughs> go out and think differently about this. If we don't move quicker, we're going to be left behind. And so it's really kind of get after this quicker, get capability to the warfighter quicker is the real focus behind Fast Track. Next slide. Um, so the path forward and takeaways. So this is kind of some actions that, that we've taken at the at the CISO level. Again, we forged this partnership with AFRL um, and that we are very grateful to because they came and they really did help the, the, the staff out um, free of charge. <laughs> So we appreciate that. And so they've helped with developing a lot of the documentation. And I think because they touched the system, uh, they, they helped give us some street cred. And um, so we've also developed a partnership with DAU. We spoke about that for training. Um, and, and we're really kind of focusing on, we're kind of going out here getting with the users so that we can really focus on a user experience, right? How you guys will really implement this process, what type of templates that you need. We're still working to do that. Um, and then really communicate between the AOs and the PMO. So we had a question yesterday about, hey, we're going, you're going out here doing this, but if the, you know, but you're just talking to the AOs and if the PMs don't agree, then we're not gonna be able to implement this. But really it is a it's really a shared responsibility. It's really gonna have to be a lot of communication between the AO staff and the PM staff. And then we want to help kind of facilitate that where we can. And we're gonna help trying to give you foundational training and a tool set. But the decision is gonna come from you guys out there to use it. For practice. So we really, um, we really urge you guys as much as possible, fail forward. It may not be perfect, but just try it. Um, that's the only way that we're gonna, we're gonna get to the next level is trying something new. And so um, I think, um, and so I do, um, I, I, we wanna leave it open for um, questions. I think we have 10 minutes. Um, Ms. Jones, do you want me to take questions on? Do you have to wanna wrap up? 
Okay, any questions? Yes, sir. Um, so, how do you use the fast track for um, enclave ACOs? Is that excluded or is that a traditional ACO? <laughs> That's actually a, a good question. I know, Ms. Kiana, did you hear that one? <laughs> I didn't, I'm waiting to hear what you have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Great question. So, um, we have had um, a lot of questions about this, so I'm not sure if you guys heard the question. Is, yeah, are we able to use Fast Track ATO for Enclave? So when, initially when we put this down, even when you look at the memo, if you look at the overview and everything that was developed, you're going to see on there is saying that we don't, want to, we don't think Fast Track is a good fit for Enclave. The reason in behind that is because um, if the Enclave has to provide, if the Enclave has to be a common control provider and um, systems and applications have to go within your Enclave, that's what you, you're gonna get it, it's a little difficult, right? Because now when, when a system is coming to your Enclave, they are expected to inherit specific controls from you. And if you have not documented those controls, really how is the system that adds to your Enclave going to, you know, going to inherit the controls? That was our original answer. I will say, since then it's changed a little bit, so I guess you could say we're on a gray area. We're also looking at doing a use case with an enclave because it, it, it start making us think again, okay, are we going back to the old RMF mentality, really, right? Because that is, typically that's what we want to say. Um, but, but it's really how can we accomplish that? So with that, we're looking at doing some, okay, let's, we may have a higher baseline for enclave because you're gonna be an enclave, you're gonna provide common controls. We may identify even what common controls you have to provide. Maybe those particular controls, we might have to do some specific answering of those controls. We can also do some reverse engineering. If you are enclave, maybe we say, if you get a pen test or a bug bound, and in that case, if an unclad enclave, maybe we wanna go something more, um, um, uh, maybe a little more hardcore, like a bug bounty or crowdsourcing, right? But crosswalking that pen test responses and reports back to your actual controls. And that's how we can still answer the controls that you will be providing as a common control provider. The, um, I was just talking to my boss about this yesterday, but the, this goes back to a risk-based decision. If you are in an enclave, you're gonna to have to make a risk-based decision that if the AO wants to come on my enclave and they do not accept this process and they do not accept what we've answered, what we use to answer the controls and they wanna walk away and not use the enclave, there has to be a risk that we're willing to accept, right? So that goes back to some risk acceptance. And so yes, we are looking to use this for enclave. Long book short, yes sir. Yeah, I was trying to get a more I did raise my hand when you asked if we, when you asked people that done fast track. Yes, sir. We went through brief and I realized we just went through this and it works. Uh, we went from our initial C and D with our AO and our FCA to our ATO with our Yes. So then we did it. We are uh, exactly. We, exactly. <laughs> and this are where, where, who are you with? Um, I work with the ATA program. Okay. A4. A4. Yeah. And just the caveat. Exactly. We are using a commercial SAS. Yes, okay. CSP. The long hold was we had to wait two years for them to get their IO5. Yes. They got their IO5 in April. We had our initial meeting with the AO. First of May, we had our ATO to get Perfect. No, and A4 is really cool because A4 is also doing a lot with crowdsourcing. They're doing a lot with bug bounty. They are really failing forward. So we have, thank you. We appreciate we have to get someone that's out there adopting because, and then maybe, I mean, you can start, can you can raise your hand again? Okay, so maybe you guys, if you have questions for, uh, uh, look, sorry to put you out here, but if you have questions for individuals who use this, I mean, that's what it's about. We have to help each other. We have to learn from one another, right? So if you have questions, sir, what was your name? Mike. Mike Schlapp. Let's see Mike Schlapp. Okay, thank you, sir. Yeah, so that's logistics. Yes, sir. So, 
So right now, I don't know of any weapon systems AO, so we don't have any use cases from a weapon systems AO. The question was, it seems like it's a more information focused and not necessarily um, weapons AO. So it really would depend on the AO and what they have in their boundary. Like maybe even some of the weapon systems, I don't know, maybe looking at some of the ground base, some of the GDSs or something like that, maybe they could use something similar to this. Um, it really just depends on the system and the environment. And you can pull pieces and parts of it. So you may not, they may not be able to do um, all pieces of, you know, fast track. And maybe in some cases they may not be able to do the, you know, the automation from a continuous monitoring standard. Are we talking about kind of SCADA folks? So I think um, it really is kind of just developing that process with those, with the, with the three tenants in mind. But no, we have not had um, a use case from a weapon system perspective. I think it's going to be a little of both, but I would say that more than likely, if you want to use it, it's probably going to be more of a bottom up, the same way as if you were trying to decide how you were going to initially move forward from an RMF perspective or what controls you were going to implement. So I would say for the most part, it's probably going to start from a, a bottom up perspective that you say, hey, this is something that we're interested in using. Does this make sense? Would this be acceptable, acceptable to you, Scott? Now, when we go into the use case, we are kind of looking across the portfolio, just from a use case perspective. Now, we are in the process of trying to see what are good use cases for the Air Force. And the Air Force does have a little seed money when it comes to this. So within the Ms. Um, Kanasenberger's boundary, she has money from a, um, from Dark Wolf that she can use to, to run some penetration testing. And AFRL has also agreed to do some use cases and do some penetration testing there. So that's where that seed money is that will come from. And now we're going to um, do some use cases. So we will be asking for um, possible candidates from that perspective. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Different levels of the acquisition 
you know, process as you're developing. Maybe we're doing some form of a pen test as we're developing and we're looking at those scripts and we're looking at code, right? And so we don't necessarily have to wait to the end. But all that is really going to have to be kind of put in place by those kind of system developers and the folks at the PM level on how, we're, how, how we plan to use it. Yes, I'm, I'm with Oracle. Yeah. We're doing penetration and testing on Kubernetes environments now. Yeah, so that's the. No, I'm thinking more from the documentation. Oh, okay. How okay. do you document a serverless application? Okay. Do you that? Yes, we agree. Um, totally. And I know that now it's some cool sivers going out here, and I think that industry agrees to this too. I know it's some, some cool sivers going out there, different ways, and GitHub that we're kind of bringing in kind of as you are developing and, and, and creating automatic documentation that feed back to the ism. So there's some cool things from a development standpoint that's kind of going out here and things like sivers, but you are absolutely right. I don't think that we have 100% caught up to that yet. In general, not just for fast track. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. I just thought I'd be the one to tell everybody about their collaboration sites where they can look at these documents to be posted at some point. Yes. Thank you. Um, and so everything is posted. Will is posted on the RMF knowledge service. So please, um, that is the that is the Air Force and the DoD authoritative source for information and documentation because we have figured out that policy moves very slow and policy can't keep up to how we're moving with our processes. So they move to kind of a more um, online automated system. So everything that we have for Fast Track will be posted out there. Now, from someone asked from industry um, from Lockheed. Um, a reference to the, the documents that we have here. I know this went through a PA review, and so my assumption is once the conference is over, these documents will be posted on a FedEx, uh, it's going to be posted online at a FedEx if you don't have like DOD CAC access to get anything from the knowledge service. Any other questions? Um, did we pass down the sign in sheet? Okay, so we, we do have a sign-in sheet out here. Um, if you guys can just sign up, what we'll do is as we have our DCS sessions, we will kind of invite you to those. Um, if you guys are interested in, um, in having any further discussion, we are here until, well, Wednesday early morning, but you can catch us in the back. We do have a lot of the process documented. We just don't have enough time to talk about it. We can go a lot more in depth on individual processes, um, but we're willing to do that. Um, if you are willing to provide, um, um, a, yeah, if volunteer be a use case, that's what my boss said, but I'm willing to help you guys out. You can provide a lemon drop martini, Tito, sugar <laughs> and I'll meet you a happy hour. We can discuss this even further. Um, but um, any other questions? I know we kind of, we're a little over. Thank you guys so much. We appreciate it.